We want to thank our friends and partners at the Atlanta Fulton County Public Library System, James Taylor and Kelly Robinson. There you are back there. Thank you for having us here. This is kind of a maiden voyage for us. And we are really appreciative to have this opportunity to come downtown and bring together some other partners. John Reese, who's the owner of Acapella Books uh, in Little Five Points, was not uh, able to stay with us tonight, but a uh, very sturdy representative is over there, and we have books. He's waving, waving over there in the corner. And we have books that are available for an opportunity coming up a little later on this evening. And um, there he is, John Moore, who is from our Public Broadcasting Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Forum Network, is here this evening. John and uh, Rennie Lindsay from our area and uh, James Taylor and Kelly all got together to pull this off, so I'd really like to thank them for making this possible. would like to welcome you on behalf of Public Broadcasting Atlanta, and we are your local NPR station, WABE 90.1, and also PBA 30, your PBS station here in town. And um, yes, you can find Sesame Street uh, throughout the week on our station. I would like to bring forward now uh, someone else who you'll recognize more than all the rest of us, even James Taylor, um, Alicia Ames Steele, who you probably recognize from seeing on Public Broadcasting Atlanta on PBA 30. <laughs> And we have a special drawing tonight. Did anyone who is here not fill out one of the slips to be eligible for the drawing? There is so much neat stuff. I cannot remember the laundry list, but trust me, you want to win um, the special prize tonight. And Lisa, uh, Alicia is going to pick one here. I think she's thoroughly agitated the, uh, the entries and uh, can give us a winner. All right, and I'm probably going to mispronounce your name, but it's Jacqueline Dansel. Is that correct? Jacqueline here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. I actually was going to try to write a few words about introducing our very special guest tonight. And the words that were provided, I don't know if he wrote them or somebody wrote them about him, but they're really, they're just too wonderful. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to pare them down a little bit. But Michael Davis, who wrote the book that we're here to discuss tonight, Street Gang, I, I was a little worried when folks in my office first came to me and said, hey, we got this great event. We want to do a thing on a book called Street Gang. I said, yeah. For public broadcasting, huh? That's appropriate. Well, after I found out it was about Sesame Street, I got a lot more comfortable with it. But Michael Davis has diplomas. Um, he would fit in very well at our place because we have two serious Tar Heels who work at Public Broadcasting Atlanta. But Michael has diplomas from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, and Northwestern University, a Master's in Journalism plus a very impressive certificate from the school called Harvard University, certifying that he was a Neiman Fellow during the 1986-87 academic year. I'm told, by the way, that he has no idea what those Latin words mean. And because a license is not required to practice journalism, something you ought to think about very deeply here, he has been free to ply the art and craft at nine newspapers and magazines in seven states. Couldn't hold down a job, could you? <laughs> Working as a news reporter and editor, a sports editor and columnist, couldn't decide what he wanted to be, feature writer, managing editor, senior editor, and executive e editor. Quite uh, an array of skills there. Throughout the years, he says he has lost as many journalism awards as he has won, but that's kept him humble and hungry. He lives, I am told, nearly anonymously with his lovely wife, Deborah, who I met earlier this evening, and their greyhound, Janie, in Yardley, Pennsylvania, way up north there. His oldest daughter, Megan, is a coordinating producer at the Discovery Channel. His youngest daughter, Tyler, is a second grade teacher in Baltimore County, Maryland. Street Gang is his very first book, and we ought to point out that Grover has way more than that. Would you welcome, please, Michael Davis? Thank you. 
That is a funny line, and it's true. Oh, goodness. We're going to have some fun tonight uh, talking about Sesame Street and, uh, and this book. And I, too, want to thank everyone from, uh, I mean, it's such a meaningful night for me. Uh, I wouldn't be doing what I do for a living had it not been for the Newport, Rhode Island Public Library, uh, where I spent uh, part of my misspent youth. Uh, I, just, I was just one of those kids who always had a big sack of books uh, slung over his back. Uh, my dad used to take me there in a big red truck, and uh, we'd go every Tuesday morning, and he'd, uh, he'd wait for me, and the car would be, the truck would be puttering outside, and I'd run in and get eight or nine more books, and off we'd go. Um, I also owe a great debt to public television. The nation owes a great debt to public television. Uh, it, it has opened our eyes to so many things in our culture and serves such uh, an important mission and I always laugh when people say, well, you know, there's cable TV. There's, there's no reason to have PBS anymore. Well, show me anything on PBS like Nature, like Frontline, like Sesame Street. Uh, when that happens, then I'll buy that argument. There's still a, a vital need in, in this country for public radio and public television. Long may they wave. And, uh, and thanks, too, to Acapella Books. Uh, my wife, Deborah, and I are, are on tour for Street Gang, and we're trying to hit as many independent bookstores as possible. We really believe in them. Uh, I just think it's such a rich book-buying experience to be in those stores. And I don't have anything against the big box stores. You know, they, they definitely serve their purpose. But I really love it when I get to know the name of the bookseller and I feel like I'm at a place that, that feels like home. So thank you, Acapella Books. Um, and those two little girls you talked about uh, are part of the reason why I wrote Street Gang. My daughters, one of them loves Sesame Street. The other one loved Mr. Rogers. And I think, you know, there probably were a lot of kids like that. There are a lot of kids like that uh, in the country. Uh, Sesame Street does such a good job of feeding the intellectual lives of children. And Fred Rogers, God bless his soul, did such a good job of feeding the emotional lives of children. And um, in a lot of markets, of course, they ran back to back uh, as they did for our local station when we were living in Highland Park, Illinois. I wrote a, a, a piece when I was working a TV guide about the 35th anniversary of Sesame Street. Um, this was back a number of years ago, just five years ago. And I just encountered these incredible people at Sesame Workshop, writers, producers, performers, puppeteers, one after another, amazing people. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised by that. It's New York City, the best of the best come there to work. Here is a show that not only has been on the air for, it will be 40 years this year, but has circumnavigated the globe. It's in 140 different countries. So maybe I shouldn't have been so surprised. But what was so surprising was this emerging narrative that, that came from doing these interviews, this backstory for Sesame Street that I discovered no one really knew. It never, had never been written before. So came the deadline for this 35th anniversary piece and I was in the last paragraph, and I started wiping tears. And I was thinking, what is this about? Why? What, what, what has brought me to this emotional moment? And I realized that I was writing about a television show that brought me back to the early 1980s, back on the couch with my daughters when they were, when they were four and two, and back to a day that, you know, it's so fleeting preschool years that goes by so fast and it's so wonderful and um, that was part of the reason why I decided to do the book but th there was more this emerging backstory about Sesame Street led me to know about this man John Stone John Stone became the legendary executive producer of Sesame Street and he really gave the show its soul He's the person who had the idea to, revolutionary idea, to create a children's program that wasn't a magic kingdom, that wasn't a treasure house, it wasn't a, a cowboy, you know, ranch, but an urban street that looked like Harlem. And it looked like Harlem because it was meant to look like Harlem. Um, the, the founders of Sesame Street 
had a target audience in mind, and that was children who were living in the ghetto, children who were arriving at the school door not nearly as prepared as their peers in middle-class homes. Sesame Street was created for the underprivileged. And this man, John Stone, had a big, big heart. And he was, as many of the founding members of the Sesame Street production team, very much into the civil rights movement in a big way. And not only with his words, but with his arms and his legs, he, he walked the walk. As did Joan Gans Cooney, the co-founder of Children's Television Workshop. Very much the same. These were people who really wanted to make a difference in the world. And they thought that they could do it by creating this experimental television show to test whether once and for all, television could really do a little bit more than just entertain children. You know, up until that point, there were a couple of good shows on television, worthy shows, but for the most part, television, I think, was a great thief of time for children in this country. There was a dinner party one night at this woman, Joan Gans Cooney's home. She and her husband, Tim, invited a few friends, and um, she made a, a, a beef recipe out of Julia Child's cookbook. Uh, and after dinner, they sat around, and one of Joan's friends, a man named Lloyd Morissette, an educational psychologist by training with a Yale degree, told this story. Just a few weeks before, he had arisen very early on a Sunday morning to find his preschool daughter sitting cross-legged in front of the television, watching the test pattern. And he wondered to himself, and he shared this story with, with the people at the dinner, what is it? about television? What is this magnetism about that would encourage a child to get out of her warm bed at 6.30 and sit there and watch nothing, hoping that the cartoons would come on soon? So he asked a question aloud. He said, do, do any of you think that television could do something more for children? Do you think it could teach? And the question hung in the air for a few moments, and Joan Gans Cooney said, I'm not sure, but I am sure I would like to try to find out. And that was the moment of conception for Sesame Street, right there at that dinner party. Because Joan Gans Cooney and Lloyd Morissette, they formed a, 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 an incredible team. She was the person who forged the content of Sesame Street. He was the person who went out and harvested an amazing $8 million eight million dollars in the in the late 1960s to create this program to start from zero to do research and development and testing and to give these folks 18 months to put a television show on the air unlike any other television show they brought together as they began to assemble the staff I mean, what I, what I call a, a confluence of genius. Um, and among those who, who brought their genius to, to the table were four men, whose curiously, their first names began with the letter J. One of them you know really well, and that was Jim Henson. The other was John Stone. There was a guy named Joe Raposo. Uh, a musician and a composer and a lyricist who ultimately gave Sesame Street its signature sound because it certainly didn't sound like any other television program musically. Uh, and there was a guy named Jeff Moss who also was a composer but he was a fine writer and fine lyricist and, and a, a, a brilliant man. In the course of the reporting of the book I discovered that all four of these men died young, that their life's work was defined by what they did for Sesame Street. And they never lived to see their grandchildren. M many of them, most of them didn't live to see 60. And unfortunately, they died from uh, hideous 
cancers and Lou Gehrig's disease, and in Jim Henson's case, as, as you know, a runaway strep infection, infection that probably could have been caught had Jim decided to go and seek medical assistance or had the people in his circle forced him to go to see, uh, to get to the hospital, but that didn't happen and he died at age 53. Well, you know, when I learned about the, those founders and what happened to them, I, I just became obsessed with this story. And they say, you know, for a first book, that's what's got to happen. You just have to love it and live it and wake up every morning just dying to get to work. And I swear that was true. I got up every morning so jazzed to work on this book, so eager to share this story. And I wasn't, I don't, I certainly wasn't motivated by money because there isn't a lot of money in this business these days. I was motivated by a desire to tell a story that I felt was so important to our culture. And one of the reasons is this book contains a lot of African American history never before told. I'll give you just one little example. One of the women, one of the women hired by Joan Gans Cooney was Evelyn Davis. No relation. Evelyn um, worked as a publicist in New York for several large African American institutions and churches. And she was just, in, every, in the best sense, a, a community person. She just knew the community so well. And Joan Gans Cooney was smart enough to hire her. And Evelyn Davis, almost single-handedly, from church to church, from school to school, from neighborhood to neighborhood, got the word out about this show. She conned Con Edison into giving her a bus. They donated a bus. And they brought this ancient tape replay equipment, put it on the bus, and brought in a monitor. And she, she stopped the bus at a corner, and she'd buttonhole people. She'd say, come on the bus, come on, come see what, what's coming for your children. And she'd load up the bus, and they'd run this tape, and she said, this is going to be called Sesame Street. It's going to help your children read. It's going to be good for us. And she did this, you know, she didn't rest until she felt that she had done a complete job, especially in New York City, of getting the word out. And I think had she not done that, had she not been so devoted to the cause, Sesame Street might not have been the success that it was. Um, and that's just one of the stories uh, in the book. And she's a, she, was a, she was a marvelous character. And you know, through the years, Sesame Street's been blessed with a lot of press coverage right from the start. I mean, for those of you who, who were old enough to remember, it, it was a phenomenon. It was crazy. Within a year, Big Bird was on the cover of Time and Newsweek. Um, you couldn't walk down the street and see a stroller without a Big Bird or a Bird or an Ernie doll. It was just a, an explosion uh, onto the culture. And, um, you know, little did I know when I started researching the book that even though they, it was such a success, they were having big time money problems in the early 1970s and they almost went out of business. Almost. Um, that's in the book. Um, they brought together a remarkable cast, the multicultural cast. Now, nowadays, you know, we're used to the idea, but in 1969, uh-uh, having whites, walk with blacks, walk with Hispanics, both the adults and the children in a neighborhood, interacting, having a, a nuclear black family with Gordon and Susan, two people in love with each other, who own a brownstone with puppets living on the, the ground floor, you know. There were some places that decided not to air Sesame Street at the, top, at, at, at the start. Um, Mississippi did not air Sesame Street right away, and not because of the adult actors, but the, the, the people who were in charge of public broadcasting then in that state felt that it was dangerous for children to see white and black children playing together on the set of Sesame Street. However, however, the strength of parents in that state, their resolute strength of saying, get this television show on the air. 
you know, they heard about how good it was and how effective it was and how infectious it was, and they were able to overturn that sort of dumb ruling that, that kept the show off the air. Parents everywhere got hooked onto the show from the start, and that's exactly as the original producers wanted it. They wanted to create a show that would be more than palatable to adults, a show that, you know, would encourage mom or dad or grandma or uh, a, an older sibling or the babysitter to sit with the, with the child and enjoy it. Therefore, they brought on Cab Calloway, they brought on Ray Charles, they brought on Yo-Yo Ma and uh, some of the greatest classical acts uh, in, in the world. They brought on rock and roll stars, they brought on Little Richard. They, I mean, it's the alumni association of artists and celebrities who have walked onto Sesame Street is probably the greatest alumni association in show business. It's amazing when you look at that list, especially African-American performers, especially. Um, but anyone who's ever seen Lena Horne and Grover's duet, that you're smiling, yes, will, will know that something really wonderful happened there on that set. And John Stone was the person who made it, who made it so. He's the person who insisted on bringing in Pete Seeger, for instance, who was persona non grata on television because of his objection to the Vietnam War. He would just never appeared on television in those days, but he appeared on Sesame Street. Buffy St. Marie, who was persona non grata on television because of her anti-war views, and uh, you know, she, she was on Sesame Street. She breastfed on Sesame Street, some of you may remember, which was an amazing episode. And uh, you can go home and see it on YouTube. So here's this multicultural cast, right? And among the members of this multicultural cast is an actor named Will Lee. Will Lee, who was an actor in the 1930s in revolutionary theater in New York, Will Lee, who was blacklisted during the 1950s for refusing to testify before the House Committee on Un-American -Amer Un Activities, blacklisted. John Stone brought him in to work on Sesame Street. And as we know, Mr. Hooper became this incredible, iconic character on Sesame Street. And he was fashioned after that old candy store operator, had a little soda fountain, had a stack of newspapers outside that you could just plunk your change down and take your newspaper. You know, in New York, it happened to be a Jewish owner. Nowadays, it would be a bodega. But, you know, in those days, you had a kind of old Jewish guy like Mr. Hooper. And um, Willie created a, a character that certainly resided in the heart, like so many of the characters on Sesame Street. And the passage I want to read to you tonight deals with his death and what Sesame Street did after Willie passed. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, will remember this. Maybe some of you who are on the young side won't, but they did a courageous thing at Sesame Workshop in not recasting the role when Will Lee suddenly died. They decided to try to explain death to children. Bear with me just a moment. Sometimes I don't know where things are in my own book. Are we all ready? Shortly after appearing in the 56th annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on November 25th, 1982, Will Lee became ill and was admitted to Lenox Hill Hospital. The 74-year-old Lee, not one to miss the parade, had braved the cold to take his accustomed perch on the float. Lee had been in fine shape that production season. He had taped a good number of segments in November and had been regaling everyone with tales from his days as a near destitute actor in the 1930s, sharing a cold water flat that by rights should have been condemned. He liked to discuss his days in Yiddish theater with the CTW research director, 
Dr. Louis Bernstein, a gentleman and a gentleman. Because Bernstein wore a yarmulke atop his skull, Lee would rattle on in Yiddish. The researcher didn't have the heart to interrupt him or disclose that he understood very little of, uh, <laughs> of Yiddish. Lee had played a range of roles in his theater career, but had never, never found the level of popular success on the stage that he had in television playing Mr. Hooper. At times, he would be a little put off when his fellow actors would extemporaneously wander beyond the script. His acting training and his respect for writers made it difficult for him to venture beyond what was there on the page. To that end, he would often run lines with his castmates, helping them to internalize the words that had been so thoughtfully crafted for them to interpret. When cast and crew learned of his hospitalization, people drew in their breaths. How could they tape episodes of Sesame Street without Mr. Hooper, the mainstay of the neighborhood? Since his first somewhat enigmatic appearance in episode one, Mr. Hooper had become many things to many young children. A surrogate papa, pawpaw, pop pop, gramps, and granddaddy, not to forget abuelo, dedushka, jadik, grandpere, nono, popos, yeye, and zedi. Mr. Hooper was that guy in the apron at the far side of the generation gap, his half-lens glasses slipping down his nose. That his establishment carried his name was of no small significance. The quirky variety store with its signature soda fountain was a projection of Mr. Hooper's personality onto an idealized social institution. Even children knew you couldn't walk away from a local 7-Eleven with a newspaper under your arm and a Slurpee in one hand promising the cashier, oh, I'll be back tomorrow to pay for it. Your, but your credit was good with Mr. Hooper because not only did he know you, he knew your mother. Will Lee played Mr. Hooper with such certainty and naturalness, he made adults suspend their sense of disbelief. When celebrity guests would arrive at the Sesame Street set for a taping, they often would walk into Hooper's store and look around, wishing they could buy something to bring home. So even people paid to engage in make-believe wanted to hold on to the illusion and when they found out the shelves uh, lined with props, they left with the only thing in stock, mild disappointment. Bob McGrath went to visit Will Lee in the hospital and was stunned to see how gravely ill his castmate was. He was not passing water, McGrath said, and I told him that if he minded the doctors and urinated, I would make sure Sesame Street would be made possible by the letter P upon his return to the set. <laughs> That might have been the last line any actor fed Will Lee, a line as funny and smart as Sesame Street itself. Lee suffered a fatal heart attack on December 7th, 1982 at the Upper East Side Hospital where he lay. A memorial service was held eight days later at the New York Shakespeare Festival on Lafayette Street. His sudden passing which occurred toward the end of a production season was no small issue for everyone associated with the show. In the months that followed, as another season was being written, the production team and research staff resolved that the part of Mr. Hooper would not be recast. Instead, the character, and by extension, the actor who played him would be memorialized on the show. In an episode that would take on the tricky business of explaining death, to a preschool audience. It was left to head writer Norman Stiles to find an age-appropriate means to convey the finality of death without causing children undue fear or confusion. The result was a truly memorable episode, one of the, so, one of the series' best. To assist him in dealing with such a sensitive topic, research director Bernstein convened an advisory group of psychologists and religious leaders to provide guidance. He said, it's what we call a curriculum bath. We bring in the experts to allow the writer to soak in the expertise. We in research bring in people to provide the information and then the artistry of the writer takes over as they integrate what they have learned. We ended up with an entire episode that dealt with the life cycle, about the naturalness of birth and death. The psychiatrists who advised us said that we needed to be mindful that children, like adults, need to find a sense of closure 
even though they don't know what the word closure means. So we tried to make a show about beginnings and endings, leading to a segment that said Mr. Hooper had reached an end point. Quote, that death was a part of life, was the lesson we needed to impart, but we had to sidestep religious matters as best as we could. So we decided that all religions deal in human memory to one degree or another. And we decided to say that, well, Mr. Hooper was not here anymore. We will always have that part of him that lives within the heart, that we have our love and that it will always stay. And at the same time, we wanted to establish that sometimes... For adults and children, expressing your feelings is hard to do. I'm going to read a little bit from the actual script from that episode. Almost all of the actors are sitting around a table having coffee. When Big Bird arrives with clutching drawings, he says, Hey, it's time for your presence. I've just drawn up pictures of all my grown-up friends on Sesame Street, and I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to be an artist when I grow up. Big Bird passes out the drawings, and he says, And at last but not least, ta-da! And he shows everyone a, photo, a picture he drew of Mr. Hooper in half glasses and bow tie. Well, I can't wait till he sees it. And everybody looks around awkwardly. Say, where is he? I want to give it to him. I know, he's in the store. And Bob says, Big Bird, he's not in there. And Big Bird says, well then, where is he? And Maria, looking around and then rising to talk directly to Big Bird says, Big Bird, don't you remember? We told you, Mr. Hooper died. He's dead. Big Bird said, Oh, yeah, I remember. Well, I'll give it to him when he comes back. And Susan said, Big Bird, he's not coming back. Big Bird says, Well, why not? And Susan, standing, stroking Big Bird's feathers, says, Big Bird, when people die, they don't come back. And Big Bird said, very sorrowfully, sorrowfully says, ever? And Susan says, no, never. Big Bird says, well, why not? And Louise says, well, Big Bird, they're dead. They can't come back. Big Bird, trying to comprehend, says, well, he's got to come back. Who's going to take care of the store? Who, who's going to make my birdseed milkshakes and tell me stories? And David said, Big Bird, I'm going to take care of the store. Mr. Hooper left it to me. And I'll make sure your milkshake, I'm, I'll make you your milkshakes, and we'll all tell you stories, and we'll make sure that you're okay. And Susan said, sure, we'll look after you. Big Bird shuffles away with his head down and says, well, it won't be the same. And Bob, his voice choked with emotion, says, You're right, Big Bird. It'll never be the same around here without him. But you know something? We can all be very happy that we had a chance to be with him and to know him and to love him a lot when he was here. And Olivia said, And Big Bird, we still have our memories of him. And Big Bird says, Well, yeah, our memories... Memories, that's how I drew these pictures, from memory. And we can remember him, and remember him, and remember him as much as we want to, but I, I don't like it. And David said, we all feel sad, Big Bird. Big Bird asks once again, he's never coming back? David says, never. And Olivia says, no. Big Bird, a little angrily, says, I don't understand. You know, everything was just fine. Why does it have to be this way? Give me one good reason. And Gordon said, Big Bird, it has to be this way because. And Big Bird says, just because? 
And Gordon says, just because. Big Bird begins to admire his drawing of Mr. Hooper and says, you know, I'm going to miss you, Mr. Looper. And Maria, smiling as tears run from the corner of her eye, said, that's Hooper, Big Bird, Hooper. Like any of us, Big Bird runs through those, that range of emotions that we all feel when someone we love passes. There's shock and denial. There's anger. There's a little depression there. There's bargaining. And ultimately, ultimately, acceptance. A piece of brilliant writing and a great performance by Carol Spinney as Big Bird and a real courageous moment in television. What other show would attempt to translate such a tricky topic to people of such a tender age? That's what makes Sesame Street so special and so unique on the landscape of, of television. And it's had its good years and less good years but it remains the gold standard of children's television in an era when I, I think we could quite, quite rightly say this is the golden age of preschool television. There's never been more great content available to us on PBS Kids and Nickelodeon and Disney Channel and Discovery Kids. It's just great. It's a great time to be three. But these folks in, in New York carry on because they really feel they have a mission. They respect their audience. They know that it's a complex society and children often have needs that can't always be fulfilled by parents who are working and you know, by, their, by, by their extended families. And so uh, they, they, they continue to offer great content to ignite cognitive thinking in children, to teach them their letters and numbers and, and the basic geometric shapes in a way that is both entertaining and enlightening. It's really hard to do, um, but they've done it for 40 years. And it explains why I devoted five years to this book. It's a story I wanted told. I'd love to take your questions. Michael, thank you. Uh, again, he's very graciously agreed to um, answer some of your questions here today, um, brought to you by the letters Q&A. <laughs> and um, John Moore has the microphone. And if you have a question, if you would please raise your hand and ask John to come to you so that we can all have the benefit of your questions, please. Yes, thank you. First of all, I'd have to say that like any great enterprise uh, in the culture, uh, um, it all starts on the page. It all starts with the writer and his or her imagination. Um, by this point, you know, 40 years in, they have a real good idea about the interior lives of these characters. They really know what makes Telly tick, that very neurotic character on, on Sesame Street. Um, and they understand the relationship between Bert and Ernie. They understand that Cookie Monster is all about the id. Uh, and so it, it always starts on the page. But um, the wonderful thing about Sesame Street is that the, the, the Muppeteers are licensed to go beyond the page to add interpretation to the lines written for them. So there's, there's a wonderful give and take that the director and the producer always encourages to make it extemporaneous and, and to kind of give the, the Muppeteers uh, enough room to create. And, you know, so, so many great segments uh, on Sesame Street were done extemporaneously. Uh, some of you re will remember uh, a young boy named John, John John in the early years. And, you know, John John would have uh, conversations with Kermit or, or Grover. And, and they were all just after the, 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 the main 
show was shot, they would just set up the camera and they'd, they'd bring in John John and they'd just let it roll. And, you know, by doing so, created one of, you know, some of the best, the most memorable moments. Uh, so, uh, it's collaborative in the best sense. Come on. Questions? I... Wow. Where's my wife? This young man in the front row wants to know if I know anything about Richard Hunt. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Hunt was a genius performer on Sesame Street and on The Muppet Show. Richard Hunt created some of the funniest characters uh, uh, on the show. Some of you may remember Don Music, the, the, <laughs> the always exasperated composer sitting at the piano when he'd get himself in a tiz and he would bang his head on the piano. Uh, Gladys the Cow, Forgetful Jones, you all know Forgetful Jones. Um, this was a man who was so funny and so bright and his story is told in Street Gang. Tragically, he, he died of AIDS and left behind an, an incredible legacy of good work and friendship and love uh, among his, uh, his castmates. Um, he was Scooter on, uh, on The Muppet Show and a lot of other cool characters. And um, I was very fortunate to be able to interview his family, his sisters, his mother, and, and those people who worked with him to get a, a good picture of how much this guy really contributed. He was a genius. And so was Kevin Clash, who is Elmo. Kevin Clash, man with that squeaky high voice, is a six foot five, strapping, handsome African American man from Baltimore. Who, it's true. Who, uh, when he was young, his mother had a home daycare operation, and he used to watch the kids, and you know, his things got crazy, and he used to entertain them with his little puppets that he made from from remnants from his mother's sewing basket. By the time he was 10, 11 years old, he was performing in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Um, by the time he was in high school, he was on television. By the time he graduated high school, he was working on Captain Kangaroo. All he wanted to do in life, all he wanted to do in life was work for Jim Henson, and he finally got that too. He was hired to be part of the, uh, the Muppet troupe. And one day, Richard Hunt, after a night of uh, lubricating his tonsils with his friends, uh, you know, a little, a little too much, um, was hungover and was very frustrated that he was getting nowhere with this little red puppet. No one could find a voice for him, a, a soul for him, a, a spirit for him. He literally took it off his hand and threw it at Kevin Clatch, who caught it and put it on his hands. And that is the moment of conception for Elmo. More questions? Jim Henson's funeral is the prologue to the book, the most remarkable coming together of the worlds of Jim Henson ever, and I think one of the most remarkable memorial services for anybody. It's, someone once said it's the only memorial service that could be taken on the road, <laughs> and it's true. It was so entertaining and so funny and so moving and so beautiful. Um, I started there because... Um, it, it, sets a, it sets up a kind of dramatic tension in the book that right around the time that, uh, that, that Jim died, he had agreed in principle to go to work for the Walt Disney Company. And unbeknownst to uh, everyone, there was a struggle going on behind the scenes. Michael Eisner, who was then CEO of Disney, wanted the Muppets of Sesame Street as part of the deal. He said, if I'm gonna spend $150 million, I need to, ha I need to have those characters. Jim Henson said, no you don't. Those, ch those characters really belong to children. Um, you know, uh, if, if anything were ever to happen to me, I, I, I would not want them to be uh, in, in any danger. And so there was this struggle behind the scenes. Eisner pulling, pulling, pulling to try to get them as part of the deal. Jim Henson pushing, pushing, pushing back. And when Jim died, um, the, the, the people at Disney were, were left with a, a, a very difficult business decision to make. You know, here they were ready to buy an entrepreneurial company, and the entrepreneurial had just passed at age 53. Um, I also used the, the, the memorial service to introduce 
some of the major characters in the book because they were all there at, in the same place at the same time. So thank you for asking that question. You were there was season 39? And oh, yes. So you must know Kermit personally, no? Yes. You, you all know that Kermit lives in Atlanta? Do you know this? Steve Whitmire, a master puppeteer, and he is Ernie as well. He lives right here in Atlanta. Yes. You know, the, the, the people at, at Sesame Workshop, and I give them a lot of credit for this, they were concerned about, you know, the, the rapid rise of, of childhood obesity, and uh, they began to wonder internally whether it was a good idea to have this character who was so, who, you know, had a cookie Jones and never ate anything other than, you know, chocolate chips. And so they used Cookie as the character to kind of build a new piece of curriculum about you know, eating healthful, you know, making healthful choices for snacks and meals. And they just kind of wanted to get the idea that even Cookie Monster, you know, mixes in a salad once in a while. Um, but it got really distorted, and, you know, it's just one of those things that it morphed in the media, and then, you know, people were writing that he's not a Cookie Monster anymore, that he's a Carrot Monster, and it's like, no. Because if you take away his mojo, if you take away Cookie Monster's obsession, he's not funny anymore. He's funny only because he's, he's got to have it, you know? Um, and those of you who watch these days know that he, he has, a, has a very fine role on Sesame Street these days because he introduces Letter of Day. <laughs> and the count gets to uh, uh, introduce the number of the day. They're using the count beautifully these days. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm very happy about that because the count was created by a puppeteer named Jerry Nelson. Another genius uh, who uh, is responsible for an entire universe of Muppet characters. Uh, but uh, the Count is my favorite uh, Jerry Nelson character. Who else has a question? Yes, sir. When they decided to release some... Uh, old episodes of Sesame Street in a box set called Sesame Street Old School, they, put, uh, they did put a warning on the box, and because the, some of the things that were done in the early years wouldn't fly in 2009. I'll give you an example. Cookie Monster in the role of Alistair Cookie, you remember him? Uh, uh, smoked a pipe, and they felt like, well, you know, we're not going to encourage that in 2009. Um, and then my wife Deborah and I discovered that, you know, when you watch it in the opening sequence, uh, you know, th th on film as the, as the theme song is rolling, there's a little girl sliding down the slide and you can see her underwear. And that wouldn't happen in 2009. Back in, back in the day in 69, you know, we would have thought it was just charming. But mm, so much has happened between now and then, it's, you know, you wouldn't do that today. So I think they were being ultra cautious in putting the warning on the box and maybe a little went a little bit too far with it and of course the media uh, picked up on it and rightfully so and questioned it but um uh, i would say i think your children are perfectly safe watching sesame street old school volume one or two and uh, it's amazing to watch it uh, to see the early days of Bert and ernie and Bert and ernie when you see Bert and ernie you are seeing a projection of the relationship between Jim Henson and Frank Oz, his best friend, his collaborator, his brother. Uh, that, that, those, those episodes, those, those little skits are so taken from the, the personalities of those men and, the, and their relationship because Jim was very mischievous and Frank was very square <laughs> in so many ways. And, um, you know, but Frank also was Cookie Monster and, uh, and Grover and a lot of other fabulous characters. Are there any second-born children here or former children here? Second-borns. Show, show me your hands. You're a second-born? Okay. All right. Sec a second-born, tell me who your favorite Sesame character is. Who's your favorite Sesame character? Grover. All right. Perfect. And she's not a plant. <laughs> Grover is the Sesame Muppet most favored by second-born children. Why? Because 
he is us. He's willing to try things. He's already had a, a trail blazed for him. Um, he thinks he's a little bit more capable than he really is, you know, when he's a waiter at, at, at Charlie's Cafe. You know, he's, he's not a very good waiter, and he's not a very good superhero, but he believes that he is. And um, I, my, my theory is not only that, that secondborns are really attracted to Gopher, but I think he's the very best teacher among the Muppets on Sesame Street. I think the things that Grover teaches you, like near and far and other things, um, are the things that stick. He's a very good teacher. And um, my favorite Muppet, by far, by a, by a mile. Okay, who else? I'm sorry? I don't know. Tell me. Who's the firstborn? Tell me. Cookie Monster, okay. Yes. Big Bird. Okay. Ernie, no. not one person says Elmo. <laughs> not one. <laughs> I guess we have to wait for the Elmo generation to come of age for that to happen. All right. Now, I've made, I made a prediction about the audience, and you, you don't let me down. I said somebody's going to tell a poignant emotional story about Sesame Street. It always happens. Somebody's got one. No? There you go. We found her. <laughs> yeah. Um, have, have any of you ever heard anyone say that their child's first word is Elmo? Was, was Elmo? Yes. Was it your first word? It was. Here's an example right here. His first word was Elmo. Yeah. Yes. All right. When did you, do you, did, did you hear from your family when you uttered your first word? How old were you, were you were at that time? Okay. You started in utero? Because I've heard obstetricians say, sometimes when the baby comes out, it says, Elmo! <laughs> yeah. Biggest rock star in the world for kids, Elmo. Come on, who has a question? Yes, sir. I think that, well, one thing for sure, Sesame Street skews younger these days than ever before, that, you know, kids start watching at about age two. And, and these days, sometimes by the time they reach age four, or certainly by five, they think uh, Sesame Street's too babyish and they move on to other preschool shows or other, you know, shows meant for older kids. Um, yes, absolutely, uh, some of those characters were done by uh, Richard Hunt and Jim Henson and um, you know, that, that they decided a afterwards to not, you know, just let the characters retire. Um, but I do think that the, 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 the emphasis these days is on Elmo, Abby Cadabby, Baby Bear, Elmo, I'm sorry, um, uh, Telly, uh, and on those characters that seem more like children than adults. That's true. Yep. They also want to sell product. Yeah, they, they want toys to move in the store. Yeah. Sherlock Hemlock was not a big seller. Oh, yes. Has there been tension between the childhood experts and the writers? Oh, you bet. But uh, I had a, a, one of the original producers uh, of Sesame Street, a wonderful man named Sam Gibbon, tell me that alcohol had more to do with the success of Sesame Street than just about anything else. At the end of the day, they'd go out and have a cocktail together, and they would resolve their differences uh, socially and, um, and, and well. Um, I mean, there have been, there have been moments when uh, I, I think there have been major disagreements that have moved all the way up to the top for Joan Gans Cooney to, to solve. 
Um, but for the most part, considering they come from, from such disparate worlds, television production people and academicians, you know, people, people from Harvard and people from, you know, who scratch and burp with the, with the, the, uh, the union guys uh, in the studio, you know, sometimes there is a collision. But for the most part, these things are resolved uh, for the best interests uh, of children. It's remarkable how well they are able to, to work together. Um, no black eyes or anything that I can tell you about. Um, all I can tell you is that what's, what Sam Gibbons said is true, that, you know, that they, they found a, a social means of leaving it at work and going out afterwards and, and bond, you know, bonding through friendship that allowed them to, and, and, and listen, just as it is on the show, um, laughter is the universal lubricant that, you know, they just tell each other jokes and stories and stuff and laughter can mitigate just about any problem at Sesame Workshop, so. Yes. Yes, asking if there were, there were, there were parts of the, of the book that didn't make it in, and yes, uh, I was committed to writing a book that would have this much heft and no more. I mean, it's 400 pages and that was the limit for me. I, I think people have incredibly busy lives. I think that when they walk into the bookstore and they see one of those thick Halberstamian tomes <laughs> that they're put off by it, you know, if you put it on the, uh, uh, on the coffee table, it could kill a small pet if it fell off. I did not want that kind of book. I wanted my book to be read. And um, so I, um, I stuck to my guns and wrote a book that's 400 pages long. I put some extra material on, on the website, streetgangbook.com. And yes, it was very hard to, to not include some stories and some of the funny stories, but. Um, uh, a story about the day that, uh, that the, the actress who played the Wicked Witch of the West appeared on Sesame Street and the consternation that it caused in the, in the studio um, and uh, how, how much John Stone's daughter wanted to be there that day and she dressed up as Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there were, um, there were a lot of little stories that, that didn't get in. One of my favorite stories is, uh, you know, after a while, they didn't have to call celebrities anymore. Celebrities called them. I mean, Tracy Ullman walked in a few years ago and just walked in through the doors and said, I'm gonna be on Sesame Street. You can't tell me no. I, 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 my daughter has never seen anything I've done on television. She's never seen any movie role. I've got to prove to this child that I really am an actress and I am a celebrity. People know me. And so she was allowed to make a guest appearance on Sesame Street. Well, one day, the, uh, the executive producer who, uh, who came after John Stone, a, a lovely woman uh, named Dulcie Singer, who did a great job as, exec as executive producer, she was sitting at her desk, phone rang, and she picked it up, and the boy said, hello, this is Johnny Cash. <laughs> and just as he you know, did at the beginning of his television show, remember that? And she thought that somebody was just completely pulling her leg and said, come on, who is this? And he had to go on to explain that it really was Johnny Cash. Um, Dulcie Singer asked everybody on the crew, all the actors, everybody in sight to wear black. Johnny Cash was the only one not wearing black that day. It was great. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Statler and Waldorf from The Muppet Show? Uh, all I can tell you is that what I've heard from the Muppet performers is that, um, that, that, that they believe that those characters were, an, again, an extension of the personalities of the, uh, of the, of the performers who were giving life to them. And that, that have you ever met a more, uh, I've forgotten your name, you're David? Yeah. Have you ever been with a, a group of people who uh, ride each other m harder than the puppeteers of Sesame Street? And the, they are s hilarious. They really go after each other. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Sadler and Waldorf is kind of a projection of the, the way that they, they ridicule each other and they ridicule what they're doing. And uh, so, and, and, and I know that, that Jim loved those two characters. Yeah. Yes.
Not really. The, he refers to a, an episode that they spent a ton of money on uh, to try to explain divorce to, uh, to children. And it had to do with Snuffleupagus and the, 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 the idea was Snuffy's mother and father were going to divorce. And they tested it as they test most shows where sensitive, you know, there's a sensitive to topic and the kids just couldn't handle it. And so they spent $125,000 on that episode and they just stored it away in a box because they just felt that kids w wouldn't be able to handle it the way that they crafted it. And, they, and there may be a way to explain divorce to preschool children, but that wasn't it. So. Do I know of any other topic that, you know, that they were unable to uh, bring to the screen? No. Um, and, you know, I'm so impressed <clears throat> at what they've done recently. Sesame Workshop has created a series of videos for children whose parents first uh, were deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan, and then they did a second video for children whose parents came home wounded and in, in w amputees and, you know, d dreadful things that have happened. And, and I don't know, have any of you seen these videos? They're terrific. They're really, really good. So, um, you know, s the people at the workshop keep trying to l eat, look out there and see what's needed in the culture, what kids need, and try to respond to it as best they can. And this particular project, it must have run on your station, right? Yeah. Um, it's just a great example of what they're doing these days domestically. And then internationally, uh, they're really committed to cr creating versions of Sesame Street in the hot spots in the world. I mean, they successfully got one launched in Northern Ireland, and they're in the Balkans, and, um, you know, they, they, they feel like they're... I, I, I think it's true that, that Sesame Street in its different iterations in the Middle East has really been uh, great for kids. I heard the Queen of Jordan say that the version of Sesame Street that airs there empowered an entire generation of women in her country. She said it. So, you know, they, they have their eye on, uh, on the, 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 glo the global stage these days. They really believe that, that they, the, the experiment, the ongoing experiment that is Sesame Street can be adapted into just about any culture. And um, they're set about, you know, the, the task of doing that. It's on, uh, every, seen in every continent but Antarctica. And if they could have it there, they would. Yes. Yeah, I, I like to think that it was that era from um, around 1972 through to the time that Maria and Luis were married. Uh, do, have, any, have any of you seen that episode done as operetta? It's beautiful. Um, I, I think that period is, is the golden age of Sesame Street. It's when all the great performers were there on the set. Jim was alive. Um, John Stone was executive producer. Um, they, they, things were really clicking. When you look at the list of celebrity guests during those years, it's just so impressive. So I would say so. That's, that's the period. Some people say that, you know, the, their best days are ahead of them. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, well, Big Bird at the start, some of you may remember, was this gawky... Uh, awkward, hayseed character who would bang into doors. And um, Jim had carried around in his sketchbook ideas for a walk-around puppet, that, a big, big bird, uh, for a long time, long before Sesame Street. And this was the opportunity to, to bring that character uh, into life. Um, but through the persistence of Carol Spinney, who is the great talent behind Big Bird and Oscar, and through the persistence of the writers, they, they found a way by season two to create a character who is really the six-year-old. You know, Big Bird isn't really a preschooler. He knows more than a lot of preschoolers know, but he also has an awful lot of questions. He's very quizzical. And so he's the surrogate child in, in the show, or was for, for the longest time the extension of the, you know, the surrogate child. Um, by the way, Carol Spinney at age 75 is, is a remarkable 
uh, talent and uh, still does Big Bird. And when you go home tonight, try, try doing Big Bird. Stand with your hand like this for 20 minutes and see how difficult it is. And look down and imagine that you have a television monitor strapped to you and that you're, you're talking to people and, and moving the character and blinking the character's eyes and singing and dancing and sometimes roller skating this way, <laughs> Carol spinning. Um, and you know, he, he was great. He narrates the audiobook version of, of, of Street Gang. And uh, we were both very happy that Oscar is on the cover. And my, my feeling is, it's the, um, this is a reporter from the Atlanta Journal Constitution asked me this question the other day. You know, you know, this is the character who would tell you the truth about Sesame Street, you know? <laughs> And the character that I think when we mature, the one that we understand why he's in the show. You maybe don't understand it as a kid, but you know we all know that there are disagreeable people in this world. There are people who don't see it the way that you see it. They live in a very different world than you do, but you have to coexist with them. You have to communicate with them. And that's what Oscar's about. He's, he's a, a naysayer, he's a recalcitrant, uh, he's difficult, but you know, inwardly, he's, he, he never does anything really hurtful. It can be a tease, like he calls Maria skinny. Um, but there, you know, he's, he's not, he's, I think there is an essential goodness to Oscar that e occasionally you see a glimpse of it. I mean, ha have any of you ever seen Christmas Eve on Sesame Street? Ah, this Christmas, r remember to, to, uh, to play it. it there's, it's, it's discussed at length in the book, uh, a, a remarkable show where Big Bird is the surrogate child and um, sort of Oscar takes on the role of the older sibling who is teasing the younger sibling about Santa Claus and asking out loud, how could it be possible for Santa Claus to bring gifts to this neighborhood? We don't even have chimneys. We just have these tiny little stacks and vents and he's not coming to Sesame Street this year, just like an older sibling might taunt a younger sibling, and just like a mother would do if she found out about it, Maria, as surrogate mom, reaches into Oscar's can and pulls him up by, the, by his neck and says, how could you, how could you do this to Big Bird? Just like you would say, how could you do this to your little brother or your little sister? It's an amazing special, really, really well done and has good music too. So, Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. When, uh, there's a quote in the book that says, if you see Christmas Eve on Sesame Street, you're looking into John Stone's soul, the guy who's the heart of the book, and that's true. More questions? Yes. I will tell you why they went away from the idea that Snuffy was a character who was primarily only seen by Big Bird, although Buffy St. Marie saw Snuffleupagus, interestingly enough. Um, it was during that period of time in the 80s when we became so concerned about abduction and about what was happening in preschoolers with children being violated, and they felt that, was it smart, really, to have a situation where Big Bird is consistently trying to convince adults that he's telling the truth and the adults are saying, no, you're just making that up. So it was at that moment in our history where they kind of said, maybe we should let this go. Maybe we should have everybody see Snuffleupagus. And for those of you who will remember, it was the, the reveal episode, including Phil Donahue with his walk around microphone <laughs> reporting from Sesame Street as if he was reporting about Bigfoot. You know, is there really a Snuffleupagus? And of course, Snuffleupagus is revealed to everyone at the end, at the end of that episode. It's a really funny, it's a really funny way to, to, uh, to resolve that little inner conflict at Sesame Workshop about, uh, about Snuffy being his in, in, in a, in imaginary friend. So, anybody else? Can I, can I ask myself my own question here? Uh, what happened to Roosevelt Franklin? Well, <laughs> did any of you remember Roosevelt Franklin? All right. Well, 
Roosevelt uh, was created by um, one of the original producers of the show, a man named Matt Robinson, um, who was um, very prideful of his blackness and his his place in the culture, his uh, his his rights, and he wanted there to be a, an identifiable black character on Sesame Street. Um, and a lot of other people did too. They were saying, I know the characters are magenta and green and yellow, but nobody sounds like they're black. And Matt Robinson came forward and said, I'll, I'll create a character. I'll do the voice. He didn't do the, uh, the puppetry. And for those of you who remember, they <laughs> created these wonderful segments at Roosevelt Franklin Elementary School. And Roosevelt was at the front of the school, and his classmates were in desks. And Roosevelt would be teaching something that day. Uh, there's a great one about staying away from things with the label P-O-I-S-O-N. That one's great. It's on YouTube. Um, but then something interesting happened. There was a, a, a great divide that occurred within uh, the African-American community. Some people felt that Roosevelt was just the perfect answer for Sesame Street. It was funny and just was spot on. But um, other members of the community, especially those who were working at Sesame Workshop at the time called Children's Television Workshop, thought that he was promoting a kind of a stereotype of African-American life that they did not want to see on television. So all of the, this Con these conflicting views fell on Joan Gans Cooney's lap and she had to make a decision about whether to keep going with a character that, w that some people felt was just promoting a stereotype. And uh, for good or for bad, she decided that that would be the end of Northern Calloway. And it was sort of the first time that a kind of a creeping political correctness came onto the show. And there were other things that happened. I mean, there's no, mo no longer is there slapstick on Sesame Street. You, there's very little physical humor. And you'll remember at the beginning of the show, you know, five chocolate cream pies, and the baker would fall down the stairs, and the pies would go everywhere, right? Um, they, they, they went away from physical humor. Um, and some other, some other things through the years that, you know, as, as, as we changed as, as a culture. But uh, if you want to laugh and laugh hard, go to YouTube and, and check out uh, Roosevelt Franklin. They're wonderful. And uh, Matt Robinson, God rest his soul, uh, is the father of uh, Holly Robinson Pete, uh, the, the, the wonderful actress. And he, his role in the creation of Sesame Street is documented in, in this book. And he's, an, he's another one that I, I, I hope you get to know about by reading the book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one quick comment and then a couple of housekeeping things. Um, these couple of episodes that Michael referred to um, when soldiers come back from the Iraq and Afghanistan war, uh, they showed us those earlier this year at a meeting of television executives, and it was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. There were, it was a room full of about 400 people in public television. And they show these episodes where people come back and, you know, how do you explain to children that somebody comes back and they don't have limbs that they used to have or they end up in a wheelchair? And there's this one scene where this vet comes back and the, the little boy wants his father to see him play ball. And he comes out in a wheelchair because he's a multiple amputee. And the, the little child sees the parent there and goes up to him afterwards, and I swear to you, there is not a dry eye in the entire room of 400 television executives. And it is that kind of thing which continues to make Sesame Street so relevant to this, this very day that they keep reinventing themselves and staying with it. And, and it is a wonderful part of our culture, and we hope that you do enjoy it every day on PBA 30. We'd like to thank you all for being here. We do want to point out that this is part of our Atlanta Forum Network uh, outreach, which is a component of the radio and television station as well. If you were here tonight, you were going to be, as it were, on television, on the computer screen. If you ask questions, you will see yourself on there. Uh, Atlanta Forum Network is a collection, uh, not only here in Atlanta, but um, throughout a number of member organizations throughout the country 
in which there are wonderful lectures, wonderful opportunities like this one with Michael uh, happening just about every night of the year and only a few people are able to be there but there is a wonderful opportunity if you go to pba.org and click on uh, Atlanta Forum Network you'll be able to see a number of lectures when we've had some folks from PBS and NPR and other folks come into town they are here we have a number of great partner organizations who have great lectures as well and you'll be able to see those so if you have any questions I'm sure that John Moore here can uh, help answer those but thank you for being with us tonight the books will continue to be on sale and Michael is going to be signing books here so if you want to talk to him further ask more questions and uh, tell your stories to Michael and share with him uh, please feel free to do so but thank you for being here with us tonight thank you. Thanks again.